Hi, thanks for coming. I think this is the geekiest title of a Republica talk I've ever um, <laughs> spoken to. Um, I got the inspiration for the talk at the meetup at the Global Diplomacy Lab last year in Montreal. And today we're going to talk about how communities use technology to improve democracy. Um, we'll have some minutes for a question at the end of the talk, so feel free to submit them under the slide dot do link hash rp17 mm, it's pretty easy and you won't have to remember the questions until the end of the talk let's get started let's start with the communities we're going to take a look at civic tech communities these are networks of volunteers who use their tech skills their coding skills their design skills and many more to build tools for citizens that help to improve the communication between citizens and the state, that make participation easier, that uh, improve access to information and many more. So in short, they are leveraging technology for the common good. We're, taking, we're going to take a look at two communities in specific, um, a network in Taiwan, where CL uh, comes from, and one in Germany. Why these two? Germany is kind of obvious, because it's the country that conveniently is surrounding this building. And Taiwan is great, because it had, has one of the biggest and most active civic tech communities worldwide. There's a lot of cutting-edge tech development going on there. And what's also very interesting is that internet and democracy evolved together around the same time in Taiwan. So you have a generation of 30-plus-year-olds that grew up with the opportunities of the internet and this new political system. So, CL, tell us a little bit more about Taiwan. So, actually, people like Julia Say are like, very new to uh, democracy in the last generation. So they're still quite eager to do participation and trying to shape how democracy is, particularly with technology, which is um, quite a thing in Taiwan. So we now see actually a lot of collaboration between technologists and also the traditional NGO workers working on uh, various issues. So since 2012, a lot of controversial issues like this uh, <laughs> is, is in great debate in the society or, or cause like huge protests of half million people on the street, um, such as government spending um, and, and financial de deficit, uh, human rights in military and the trade deal with China, which is always a big problem, you know, and pension reform and all other controversial legislations. So this um, actually made a lot of the technologists think maybe their skills can be used to um, to build new tools for the general public to more to understand these issues before they start a debate, and then take actions. Um, is this really broken? Okay, it's back. Right, so for those of you who are not too familiar or not too sure where Taiwan is, it's right there. Very tiny uh, compared to Germany, right? We're about 23 million people and uh, uh, we are uh, six hours in the future, so I'm from the future. <laughs> so the community in Taiwan we started is called GovZero.TW. So it's basically like replacing the GOV or the government with a zero in it. Like it's hoping that we can build alpha version of the government website or services, and for um, um, the, the user of the government website, we just have to change one character in the URL, and then and then suddenly you have a, a, a better uh, website with uh, using new technology or or providing open data. So the community in Taiwan we started uh, in 2012 uh, quickly attracted other, all other professions uh, beyond software developers. So uh, like um, writers and the lawyers, designers, they're starting to like um, collaborate in a very unusual way that's not happening uh, in their professional before. Um, so it's like the open source way of collaboration, but for different people as well. And even public servants are coming to our uh, events and then working together uh, from different agencies, which they, uh, they never talked to each other before. So one example is that uh, we built, oops, we built um, the, the Congress website is called ly.gov.tw. Uh, so we built a community version called ly.g0v.tw, which combines all the different um, uh, information about like past performance of the Congress member uh, even when they're in local council, and also their uh, financial disclosure, and uh, um, maybe they don't want me to talk about that. <laughs> and, uh, 
everything together. So that's the community built uh, version of the Congress website. So the Gov Visual community not only embraced the release early, release often mentality from open source that allowed uh, rapid collaboration and people trying to uh, work on existing tools, um, people have also developed a very strong uh, doer culture. So people just start building things without uh, like ha having to have a grand meeting first. So um, basically when they see something that can be done, we start doing it. That's why we call uh, the fork the government in the title of this session, because we just start building something experimental. So today, more than uh, 3,000 people have contributed their ideas or code or patches or fixes to uh, over 100 Gov Zero projects uh, since 2012. Although so Taiwan and Germany are separated by thousands of kilometers, it took uh, CL 15 hours to get here, and the cultures are a bit different, uh, yet both civic tech communities are tackling similar issues, and you'll see that in a second. In Germany, the volunteer network is called Code for Germany. There's 25 labs in cities all across the country, um, and they are working on like pushing openness and transparency, and... Um, Unlike Taiwan and Germany, since we've been talking about uh, democracies, democracy uh, has been around for a while, but um, there are more and more reminders that we, that we shouldn't take that for granted, that there's always uh, room for improvement and that democracy has to be filled with life. This is why the thematic focus of the Code for Germany this, uh, community this year will be on the upcoming elections. I don't know whether you know that, but the most successful civic tech tool in Germany is Valomat, a vote matching machine. I'm sure like many have tried it out. It's an app that helps you to compare your opinion and views with uh, election programs. So in the upcoming months, the community wants to explore um, more useful tools and um, that help to make access to this information easier and that encourage people to vote. And one of our focuses will be on opening up polling station data because currently you only receive a letter and you can see your nearest polling station or you can visit your city's website, I believe. So we think that to open up polling station data will help people to easier find their next polling place. So now you might ask yourself, huh, why are there all these people that are in their spare time uh, working on these topics and um, trying to push these topics? Isn't there a thing called e-government and governments and public ad administrations are already working on digital tools and infrastructure? Um, well, yes, uh, they are working on the things, but as you see, like in the polling station data example, um, and the fact that it's not accessible um, for whatever reason, um, you can see that it's still very limited how people can access information and how technology is put to use in uh, these contexts. So the actual problem of that is the government are just trying to apply the new technology into their existing paper process without rethinking the possibility of technology. So like all these promises of new form of participation and the more feedback channel from the citizen and better communication or, or, or so on are just, well, still promises because they are not rethinking all the possibility of the technology. So now let's uh, try to imagine you are a cyclist in Berlin. Are you? <laughs> Yay. So, and you want to find out where dangerous roads are and where accidents are happening. So naturally, and then how they can be improved. So you're probably trying to think, maybe I will we'll build a website that collects people's opinion and they, they will submit that where uh, dangerous roads are. And then you will create, start to create a community of cyclists in Berlin that will help the government to improve. Oh, this needs to be fixed first, right? And so like, you can then do also analysis and research pattern and the weather comparison and so on. And some of you might remember, in uh, 2013, the Berlin Senate actually did that. They collected information on dangerous intersection, on um, accident hotspots. Um, so this was a big like, crowdsourcing um, participation project. And within like, one month, 8,000 people commented and uh, gave like, suggestions on how to improve like, certain intersections which is really cool. It would have been easy to pick like a complete fail uh, e-government project, but this one was actually pretty great because a lot of people collaborated. But then, instead of leveraging the full potential of the collection of data points and comments and sharing it back to the community, 
all people got out of this was a report. So now you can like, look at the thing and see, okay, here are the most dangerous intersections and here are some recommendations from citizens. Um, they even thought about sharing the data, but I, could, I was not able to find it, neither back then nor now. So imagine what you could have done with all these data sets and raw information. Map services could have included it in their like, um, routing and could have warned cyclists, or you could have overlaid it with actual police data to see, like, does it match? Um, you could have overlaid it with construction activities and ma many more. But instead of leveraging these opportunities, all that was issued was a report. So a uh, successful crowdfunding, but then like, not really like, using uh, the potential that like, this digital collection of data could have given us. So, um, so what can we fix that? So, um, but that's a good reason that government are being slow and then not using the latest technology because they have to be reliable and uh, they have their accountability issues. So, because their services also need to be inclusive and secure for everyone to, to use, right? But in the meantime, the government is missing out all this new uh, technology that, uh, and they should be open for this new opportunity that, uh, that advanced technologies bring and the new ways of building digital services, uh, especially with human-centered design, what the citizen actually needs. So how can this, uh, like, the, the process be improved? So we are going to give you uh, a couple of examples and that's uh, coming from both the Taiwan's community and Germany's, commu Germany's community. Um, the first one is financial transparency. And so uh, on the left-hand side, you see the official budget uh, report, which is about 500 pages of PDF. So a couple of years ago, we built uh, something to extract all the data and then a visualization of the budget according to ministry and the type of business. And uh, uh, you can also see the history of individual entry of the budget. And um, it was actually the first project in the GovZero community. And about three years later, um, because the Taipei city government, uh, they're trying to uh, uh, start their uh, participatory budgeting uh, project, and then someone told the mayor, hey, you can't actually do participatory budget if the people don't know the existing budget, right? Because it will be really weird. They might be proposing something that you're already planning to do. So the mayor said, okay, uh, so what should we do? And then someone in the community said, hey, the community actually built a tool to show the budget. Uh, we can actually just reuse that thing and then apply it to the city government's project. So actually, so they took the code from uh, our project, budget.govzero.tw, and turned it into the official way of displaying budget at uh, budget.taipei. Um, so um, they, uh, in addition to, to that, they actually collect feedback on individual budget line, and then people can comment, and then within 30 days, uh, all the agencies will respond to their inquiry about the budget. And here is a tool from Germany around parliamentary transparency that I really like. Um, it's a tool that helps to increase transparency. It is developed by Maximilian Richt, a developer from Munich, who in his spare time builds tools like this. The tool is called Kleine Anfragen, and uh, to give you a bit of uh, context or translation, in Germany, opposition parties can file so-called Kleine Anfragen, parliamentary inqu inquiries, um, and the government has to respond. So Kleine Anfragen are basically a pretty good accountability tool that can give you lots of insights. And the great thing is that all the files are made public to um, the citizens. But here's the flaw only in PDF formats, uh, which are kind of hard to access to find. The PDFs are also scattered across numerous government websites, which makes them even harder to find behind like, uh, search interfaces uh, and so on. So the pity is that while there's this treasure trove of information available to the public, um, the high barrier to entry prevents the data from, be from actually being uh, put to good use. So Maximilian decided to change that, so he scraped all the PDF documents, he indexed them, he made them searchable, he linked them based on ministry and uh, contents, that's the website, kleineanfragen.de. When you visit it, you have over 60,000 documents at your fingertips. Uh, you have full text search, you can subscribe to actual search, search terms, so if you're interested in minimum wage, um, then you can subscribe to this search term and like, get a notification whenever the topic uh, comes up, and you can link to the individual documents, which is also a new thing. Um, yesterday, inspired by Peng, the Peng Collective's um, 
um, action, I searched for uh, arms, arms exports in this database, and it gives you 65 different documents that you can like view in this list. When you click one, that's the detail view that lets you even extract data from this very inquiry. And uh, this is a great tool, not only for the general public, but also for researchers, for journalists, and which I think is like the most interesting fact here, also for the public administration, because what we've found is that the Parliamentary Research Service is linking to this tool. So the community basically developed a tool that might be easier to use than the official government tools, like easier to link to, and uh, you can see a bunch of reports that have like the URLs um, um, directing to this tool. That's an example from Germany, and now another one from uh, Taiwan. So um, there was a, a controversial legislation about the change of uh, the labor standard code, like defining maximum hours you can work every week. And then in the community, uh, people build a calculator that's uh, displaying, if you just put into like the regular hours you work each day in the week, and then it would just show you like the current version of the law, law and the proposed version by the government and some proposed, other proposed version from the NGO and how the difference would be. Uh, for example, you will get more over the pay time and, uh, or is it entirely illegal for you to work on weekend? And so this tool was built by someone in the community, but then the Ministry of Labor uh, started to think, oh, maybe we can use this thing to uh, communicate with the general public about our legislation. So they actually took this code and then um, fixed some of the uh, more ambiguous uh, text in it. And then, and then uh, so when they take this code, they also contribute back to the community, community's version. And then um, they use this one to... Um, to show the people how their proposed version would be looking like. And I think this is, um, to sum it up, for the example we've seen, um, we can see... Um, that in our first example with the budget, the government merged something back, which is kind of uh, impressive. Uh, it's one of the very few examples that I know of, and uh, I hope this is also going to happen in Germany in like the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. And the second example, so in the labor code calculator we just saw, the government not just reused the source code, but more importantly, along with the code, is the mentality that behind it that connects the uh, legislation with the people it affects. So uh, hopefully this will be a, a good standard for future legislation. People, uh, the legislator or the government can start thinking about, um, okay, how do we uh, connect this proposed legislation to the general public? How would this affect people and how do we tell them uh, what's happening? And for Maximilian's example, the Kleine Anfragen tool, public administration is already using it, so a next great step would to improve access to the information to make it easier for Maximilian to actually um, yeah, receive all this uh, information without having to scrape PDFs. And of course it would also be awesome if um, the government or the public administration would just reuse his source code because it's an open source tool or like, use the inspiration to develop a similar tool. So all these projects we mentioned are developed by uh, engaged citizen, by volunteer in their spare time, and uh, with the help from others in the community, even global community. So city hackers are using their skills and the know-hows um, to show the possibility of, of emerging technology in our civic life uh, with the mission that citizen participation should be well, and will be accessible and Im impactful. Um, so the complex problem of now we're facing in the globe uh, um, uh, in the future will need to be solved together by all of us. So these were just um, a few examples there. They are like from the active civic community around the world. Um, there is also uh, a good network uh, for, for, for people in various countries doing the same thing called CoFO. So you can check out on CoFO.org and learn more about it. And in September this year, we'll be hosting the first ever uh, Civic Tech Fest in Taiwan uh, for people around the world to share their experiences of how they uh, do this kind of thing with technology and, and uh, work or uh, collaborate with government or not. Yeah, and last but not least, we wanted to thank the Global Diplomacy Lab that made it possible for CL to travel all the way to here. And uh, the lab is an initiative which is based in the Federal Foreign Office, and it's exploring new and more inclusive um, diplomacy that goes beyond the traditional politics. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, the Global Diplomacy Lab, and yeah. 
we have some we have some time for questions now. You can check out the Slido. Someone have a question? I'll also check out the Slido. Any questions? Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I was wondering when you mentioned the participating budgeting program, how Taiwan is um, handling digital divide issues or even the question is, how is the internet distributed over Taiwan? Um, yeah. uh, the, the background for the internet coverage in Taiwan is uh, pretty, pretty good, I suppose. I think 85% uh, of the household have broadband. And uh, for, but still, um, in things like citizen participation and participatory budget, um, they're hosting not just online presentation, but also like real world uh, to be more inclusive. So um, I, can, I can tell you a bit more detail about the, the budgeting uh, project in Taipei uh, if you want. And, um, but just want to give a quick background about the uh, digital device situation in Taiwan. Yeah. Any more questions to Seal or Julia? Ooh, careful. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. <clears throat> uh, so the examples that you gave were of taking data that's being released by governments uh, and remixing that into a form that makes more sense. Do you have any insights into what you do in a case where government's not releasing the information or doesn't maybe have a plan how to do that? Yeah, how do you do it in, in Taiwan? Um, so the community generally uh, only work with the information that's only available. There is one case that uh, it's about campaign financing uh, details. So uh, the information was supposed to be public, but they're probably inside a building. You have to go there with your ID and then uh, they can give you a paper copy of that. So um, it was an NGO who uh, like mobilized quite a few dozen people to go there every day and then just copy it out and then go to a print shop, scan it, put it online. And then people created a, a, a program to turn all the scanned document into a, a CAPTCHA program. So uh, it's like playing a game, you're just entering uh, the number you see on the screen. So this is like a good uh, example of this disruption. Like the first batch of the data is about 300,000 entries and about 10,000 people participated in 24 hours and then digitized everything. But um, still, um, we are still trying to push the government or the, the, the auditing, it's actually in the auditing uh, office to actually release that data in digital form because they already release it in paper form. Yeah. Mm, what we also do is innovation without permission. So you ask like, you ask if, you, if they give you the data and if you have good reasons why you think it should be accessible to everyone, you just scrape it or take it and then spread it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, some of the tools that you presented here seem kind of similar to tools that I've seen people working against corruption in, for example, the Ukraine have been using to try to show what the national budget was like to make sure that you could see, okay, how is your money being spent and how do you think that it should be spent and how do you then see where money is disappearing? How could we make sure that the tools that are being created can be shared across the world and also go to places where we need activists to actually fight to get the information out of the governments where the governments aren't giving it willingly. The question is how can we make sure that people know about it and that... How can we, for example, share the code that's being developed in Taiwan mm -hmm. with other places and is um, Global Diplomacy Lab trying to make sure that this code is being shared um, to activists mm -hmm. in other countries that aren't as fortunate as people living in Germany or Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I think one very important, in, uh, very important thing when we talk about like redeployment is that you cannot just take a piece of code and apply it to a completely different uh, cultural context. So you always have to keep in mind the cultural context and also that you have to adapt stuff. So this notion of redeployment and just like rolling it out across the world does not really work. But I think that to like bring developers together with like 
people who have expertise around certain issues in their home countries, I think that's the, that's the way to go for it. And there's a format called replication sprints where exactly that is being, being done, where like a piece of technology is taken and like redeployed, but also with the like larger context in mind. So the, the COFO network around the world collaborate that and, and then make sure people know what's going on and then uh, which country develops something interesting. And like Julia said, it's you, you, sometimes not possible to redeploy it, uh, but we do see a few examples. But uh, in the meantime, what happens is usually uh, some, some kind of standard or, or best practice come out from the collaboration and people know, okay, if you want to tackle this problem, here are the components you can use already and here are the standard. And then we, if you can just convert the government data into this standard, then it will be available to all these tools. Thank you very much. Thank you, CL. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. For Thank you. this talk. Um,